Well, good morning, everybody. We're glad that uh, you've chosen to come and worship here with us this morning. Um, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. Um, it's going to be on the screen uh, above us, um, but if you are comfortable in doing so and willing, would you stand for the reading of God's word here this morning? A text that um, is spoken oftentimes during this uh, Advent season. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord, and you may be seated. We all um, have plans. Some of us have great and majestic plans. Some of you are dreamers. You have visions of a certain life or a certain outcome, a certain way of living. Maybe it's a retirement plan or portfolio that will allow you to move south or buy a camper or travel. I want to buy a tiny home. Leah does not. We'll wait to see what happens. Some of us have plans to someday own our own businesses or maybe to open a restaurant. Some have plans to settle down and get married, buy a house, have a family. Some have plans to go to college or maybe to start a career. For some of us, our plans don't extend any further than lunch plans this afternoon or sitting on the couch watching football and taking a nap. These are people who don't have children. I, now, I would not consider myself really to be a big planner, uh, but when I'm involved in something, I do tend to plan it out and make a plan. Uh, so I know what I'm doing and perhaps most importantly, what to do next. Um, There have been times in my life when I have made plans, and those plans have not always gone as I had hoped, or certainly not as I had anticipated, not always knowing how things were going to turn out, and not always knowing or anticipating what might happen next. When I was 21, I moved to Pennsylvania to be a youth pastor at a church, another free Methodist church, and by every measure, it was a success. It was a youth group that had started with six or eight kids, and it was in the high 40s um, by the end of my time there. Uh, as a result of that, I think, uh, I was asked to um, be the senior pastor of that church when the pastor had left. Um, and by every external measure, it was a success. Uh, we were making plans, looking to hire staff, uh, and then the bottom fell out. Family after family moved or were transferred to new locations because of job instability in the area. Um, Other people just moved to greener pastures. Some retired, you know the drill. Uh, We lost close to 50 people in a little over a year. The new superintendent, who, by the way, also was the old pastor, told me I should have never been appointed as pastor and hadn't earned that church And probably it was best for me to move on. Not exactly how I had planned it. In 2001, I applied for a youth ministry job at a church in the Gateway Conference that had not too long ago built a new building and was looking to add staff. At the same time, some friends of mine were planning a church in Las Vegas and had asked me to join their team in a non-paid position to help them launch their first service. I took the job in Las Vegas and turned down the youth ministry job at a church in Alton, Illinois called Emanuel Free Methodist Church and moved to Las Vegas, only to have the lead pastor quit three months later, having never even launched a single service. Not exactly how I had planned it. But a Greenville University student, Dustin Fenton, who had interned out in my church in Pennsylvania and lived with me for summer, was still connected to the resident director of Joy Hall. Uh, He told that RD that I might be looking for a job, and Greenville called me and soon offered me a job that paid very little, 
uh, but covered most of the costs of getting a master's degree. Uh, I had thought about going back to school to be a counselor, but Greenville said you can go to one of two schools and you have to master in education. So I went, even though it was not what I had planned. From those disappointments and failed plans, I got an education, one that I loved, I really enjoyed that, a career that was a good fit for me, and did I mention that I met my wife? Now at Central, where we went later, I reluctantly took on extra responsibilities as the director of admissions, in addition to all the other things that I was doing. And while I was just simply looking for addresses on the denominations website, I came across a job opening at Emmanuel Free Methodist Church. Not exactly what I had planned, but here I am. And it's working out great. Now, of course, there are all kinds of gaps in this story, which really only covers my work history. But through 24 years of my adult working life, there has been plan after plan ruined by God. Sometimes those plans were wonderful surprises. At other times, they hurt deeply. I was humbled before God and at times horribly embarrassed. To understand our passage this morning... I think we have to understand them through the lenses of plans. Without going through a 30-minute history lesson, let me give it to you with as much brevity as I can. The people of God have chosen to trust in human glory rather than God. That's sort of the context of the text leading up to what we read today. The nation in Isaiah's day was ruled by leaders who did not care about the people under them. Pride made Israel think it would recover and rebuild in its own strength. Isaiah was writing to the nation of Judah, but he used the northern kingdom of Israel as an example of the fact that God's judgment is severe. Even as these words were being penned, the northern kingdom was already in despair, Judah should have realized that she too would be destroyed if she continued in her sinful ways. However, Israel's inhabitants apparently felt that they would only experience a temporary setback and that they could rebuild better than before. But in God's plan, this was not to happen. He judged them for their hardness of heart and their refusal to return to the Lord. Israel was being led astray by false prophets and foolish leaders. The nation would not listen to God's word. Ephraim's own wickedness was destroying the nation the way, of, uh, the way a fire destroys a forest or a field. And in their greed, the people of the northern kingdom were devouring one another and battling one another, but they would not soon be devoured and defeated. They would soon be devoured and defeated by Assyria. So as a result of their choosing human glory, not to come back to the Lord, that whatever they were going through was just temporary, and they could rebuild it, and they could do it themselves, and they could do it better, and they would get all the glory. As a result, Judah, much like the northern kingdom, was shrouded in darkness and despair. God allowed them to suffer the full weight of their own arrogance and pride. Judah believed that they were fully capable of handling life, rebuilding the kingdom alone, without the help of God. They chose their own way rather than God's way. They trusted in human glory rather than in God. The nation plunged itself into darkness And despair. John Oswalt writes Instead of having the protective canopy over them and being guided by the pillar of cloud and lighted by the pillar of fire, they are in confusion and darkness. What an awful description. If you've ever been in a place in life where you felt that you were shrouded, by confusion, didn't know which way is up, didn't know which way to turn, and darkness, you were in despair, you were lost, 
you are grieving, you are hurting, you feel like you have no place to go. And maybe you understand what was going on in Judah. Judah had plans. They were going to be great. And they were going to do it without God. The result, like any great plan that doesn't involve God, they drifted further and further away from him. But God ruins their plans. And when we get to the text that we read this morning, God has already ruined their plans. In fact, God says that he hardened their hearts so that they would not be capable of returning to him. Sort of a hardcore, you made your bed, now you have to lie in it, move by God. And have everybody used those words with your children? Well, you made your bed, you got to lie in it. Well, am I the only one? Heard that? He permits them to have their own way. Now, did you get that? God permits them to have their own way. To rely on their own wisdom and their own protection. So when God gives them over and hardens their heart, what that really means is, okay, you do you. And I'll back away. And let's see where that goes. And he wanted them to to experience the full weight of their own decision. The results are devastating and greatly humbling as the plans of Judah move them further and further away from God. Further and further into darkness and despair. But there's more to that story. You might remember in part one of this series we discussed the idea of the word motif. Remember, the word motif means a pattern. In music, it's a series of notes that play a melody that when interrupted, returns to that melody later on. In literature, it's a common thread or meaning that may be interrupted only to be returned over and over and over again. So in other words, the character or emphasis of the story remains true and shines through. It's a common thread. The rest of the story is God returns to his motif. Another way of saying that is he makes he returns to that motif and he makes a promise. He returns to that which shines through. In other words, he returns to the character of who he is. God knows what God's about. And he returns to that same thread, that same story. He returns to the character. He allows that character to shine through. In Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 2, it says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the Lord of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations. But by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. In the midst of, his dar- of the darkness and despair that the people chose, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to get the glory. We don't really need God. Whatever happens, it won't be that bad. It'll all be worth it. Well, if it doesn't go right, I can always come back and say I'm sorry. In the midst of their sinfulness, in the midst of their darkness, in the midst of their despair, a flicker of light in the dark, a flicker of hope has dawned. And the people have done nothing, nothing to earn it or to deserve it. It is only by the nature and character of God that this flicker of hope happens because the character of God is a God of grace. 
It is by his grace that there's some semblance of hope in their dark world. A people created in the image of love continued to choose to be unlovely, but the character of God shines through. That's the motif of scripture. He will not make them wallow in humiliation and embarrassment. His character won't allow it. And so he brings light out of the darkness. It reveals a deep truth about God. There is always purpose when God humbles. Did you catch that? That's part of the flicker of hope. There is always purpose when God humbles. Oswald again writes, if God has humbled a person or a nation, it is for the final purpose of giving that person or nation honor. He brings us down only because given our sinfulness, that is the only way he can raise us up. Dr. Alan Redpath states, when God wants to do an impossible thing, he takes an impossible person and crushes him. When God wants to do an impossible thing, he takes an impossible person and crushes him. Nowhere in all of human history is that statement ring truer than in the person of Jesus Christ. The restoration of humanity after we allowed sin to dominate our lives, we chose to live in darkness after we have been humbled by our, go, our going off and, and doing our own thing, seeking our own selfish desires. God does the impossible thing by taking an impossible person from Nowheresville, Bethlehem, the Son of God in the form of a fragile human baby to redeem the world. And he does so by crushing his son. That is why we were reminded that he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. This is a prophecy of old fulfilled in Jesus and will come to perfect completeness when he comes again to establish his kingdom. I love the last line, though. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and look at the, at the last line that we read. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. In other words, it will be accomplished through the passionate involvement of God in the affairs of people just like you and me because he loves us. That flicker in the darkness is now a great light, a beacon of hope to all who would choose to follow it. And what you're following is a wonderful counselor you want to know what direction to go? Seek out the wonderful counselor. You want something to put your trust in? How about a mighty God? You want somebody who you can rely on? Boy, you can't rely on anything any better than an everlasting father. You want to know what it's going to take to kind of give you this, this sense of peace and confidence and clarity. I think that comes best from the prince of peace. The zeal of the Lord. He wants to be involved in your life. Passionately involved. Now, there are many, many times in our lives where we struggle with this idea of God ruining our plans. Um, 
taken from our text today and with a little bit of old stuff mixed in, let me give you three things that I think are relevant to our day-to-day life when God messes up our plans. The first thing I think is, and it's evident here in this text, when God messes up your plans, when God messed up the plans of Judah, he's trying to get their attention. And I think that's probably the case with many of us in this room. When God messes up our plans, he's trying to get our attention. It's not punishment for things that you've done, although, you know, maybe God does that. I think he probably does, but but he, he tries to get our attention. So God has to rearrange our plans to say, wake up. Let me get your attention. God speaks to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our problems. Wake up. This is not our plan. This is not my plan. You can't, this is going to fail. This is going to lead to some natural consequences for your stupidity. There are natural consequences to our stupidity. Psalm 81 says, God says, I wish my people would listen to me. Why does God want you to give your attention to him? Because it will spare you a lot of heartache and pain. We get ourselves into lots of trouble when we don't follow what God tells us to do. Proverbs 16 says, there is a path therefore, there is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. A lot of things in life look like the right thing to do, but when you get to the end, it's a dead end. It's a disaster. We've all had plans that just didn't go the way that we intended them to go. Why? Because you don't know the future. And neither do I. Because we don't know the future, we don't know how things are going to turn out in spite of our plans. That's why God says, I want you to listen to me. I want you to follow my plans. Because God does, God does know the future. He can see around each corner. He can see the problems, the detours, the roadblocks that are coming up. If you just listen to him, you can avoid some awful pain in this life. In the Bible, there are many things where God, uh, many things where God says, "If you do these things, you'll be successful. You'll be satisfied. You'll you'll find meaning. Life will be easier. If you do these other things, it's going to cause misery, guilt, resentment, broken relationships. It's going to cause anger and worry and of of all kinds of sorts and things." When he tells us what to do and what not to do, it's not because he's some ogre or some cosmic cop in the sky, some bully just trying to make up rules. He does it because he loves us. And oftentimes he does it because he has a better plan. For Judah, God had a better plan. He was trying to create for himself a people that he could love, that he could be with, and that sin that they chose to be in separated. They drifted further and further away from God because they kept choosing over and over and over again their own sinful desires. You know, when the word of God says that, uh, talks about to, to experience the pleasures of sin for a season, that's not a license to say, yeah, I can experience that for a season. There's a risk involved in that, always. And that risk is that it pulls you further and further and further away from God. That's what Judah is experiencing. But God has a better plan. And God has a better plan for your life. When God messes up your plans, he's trying to get your attention because he has a better plan. But here's the thing. No one wants to hear this, okay? So if you don't want to hear something tough right now, go ahead and put your fingers in your ears, okay? None of you did. Good. God's plan for your life is harder than your plan. It just is. It's better, more fulfilling, more satisfying, reaps eternal benefit, but it's hard. Sometimes it's not easy to follow God. Sometimes he takes us to places where it's not comfortable. That's why so many people try to cut and run on God. 
human beings and human nature, it's always in there for us to take the easy way out, to slide through life, to take the path of least resistance. God says, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. In fact, it's going to be harder my way. Why? Because God is more interested in your character than he is in your comfort. He wants you to grow up. He wants me to grow up. He wants you and I to be mature. He wants us to be people of character and integrity and take responsibility. He is in no way going to take all the problems out of our lives. It's a harder way, but it produces character. God has a bigger perspective than we do. When you see life from his perspective, you'll see what he wants to do so much more clearly. And you'll see that what he has in store for you is more than you could ever hope or imagine. He has a bigger perspective. If you don't get anything else out of this, get this. God made each and every one of us. Let me rephrase that. I want to make that more personal. God made each and every one of you for a purpose. And you have no idea how much God wants to work through you. How much he could do through you if you were totally committed to his plan and your life rather than your little plan in your life, your dreams, your ambitions, your goals. If you say, God, here I am totally available to you. Do with me what you want to do. Imagine what God might do. But ultimately, it comes down to the fact that God knows what God's about. In our text today, Judah chose to not put their trust in God, but to put their trust in their own abilities so they would get the glory. God humbled them, and he foils their plans because he wants them to learn to trust him. You see, when God messes up our plans, he's trying to get our attention to let us know that there's a better plan. And oftentimes it's because he wants us to learn to trust him. To believe that he is who he says he is and that he'll do what he says he's going to do. That he'll fulfill all of the promises that he speaks throughout scripture. That he is who he says he is and he'll do what he says that he will do. He wants us to learn to trust him. But isn't that what trips us up in almost every relationship? Do you trust that the people that you work with are going to deal with you honestly? If you do, you probably have a great work relationship. If you don't, it's probably hard to go to work. Do you trust when you buy something that you're not getting a lemon? If you do, you feel confident in making purchases. If you don't, you have anxiety. Do you trust that when you drop your kids off at school that the teachers are trustworthy? If you do, you feel great dropping them off. You know that they're getting what they need and they're going to be provided for. If you don't, you sit at home anxious and worried about what might happen when you're not around. Do you trust your spouse? Do you trust your kids? Do you trust your church? Do you trust When we don't trust, all those relationships and so much more crumble around us. We become fearful, we become prideful, and we become controlling, and we make our own plans. When we do that, it is easy to forget about God. It's easy to lose trust in him. And just like Judah we move farther and farther and farther away from God. Here's the key concept that I want us to grapple with. And I think this is a hard one for us to grapple with. When God ruins your plans, he is humbling you, not harming you. When God ruins your plans, he is humbling you, not harming you. Now, when I say that he's humbling you, I'm not saying that he's he's kicking you while you're down. I'm not saying that he's throwing you to the ground and he's he's kind of 
putting his thumb in your back or he's putting the, the, the heavy weight on your chest because he wants you to be miserable. But sometimes, as we get farther and farther away from him, he's got to take us down a few notches so that we realize our need for him. And, and there's a difference between hurting and harming. When we're humbled, it hurts. When I go to the dentist, humbled because, um, I don't know, I may have eaten too many Christmas cookies or too many sweets, and the dentist says, you have cavities, and he gives me a shot, and he does that. That's a pretty good impression, isn't it? Some of you are really, really tense right now. That's humbling for me, and it hurts, but in the end, I'm not being harmed. I'm actually better. When we go to the doctor, sometimes that, what the doctor does, I, I had a frozen shoulder one time, and I had to do uh, therapy, uh, physical therapy, and it hurt when she did that. She did these things called dry needling where she stuck a needle into the, the, the knots and the muscles in my back to get them to relax, and, you know, it didn't feel great to have a needle stuck in my back. And then she, she hooked it up to what I envisioned was the battery to a lawnmower. And it, I did one of those numbers because she had it turned way up because somebody else may be playing a prank. I don't know. It hurt. It was humbling. But it didn't, it didn't harm me. It made me better. When God hurt, Ruins your plans. He's humbling you, not harming you. How do I know that? Because in three days, we get to celebrate the fulfillment of the first part of this prophecy from Isaiah. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. Why would he do that if he didn't have better plans for us? And here's what I have known to be true about the God I serve. He is a wonderful counselor. He is a mighty God. He is an everlasting father. And he is my prince of peace. And our future is a great government, a peace that there will be no end to. He will reign over his kingdom. He will establish it. He will uphold it with justice and righteousness and all the things that lead us to not trust, all the things that lead us to want to make our own plans, all the things that keep us away from him will be removed from us and we can be fully and completely his from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord, the passionate involvement of God in your life will accomplish this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for your love for us, your grace that pours out for us. We thank you, Jesus, for the gift that we have this Christmas of a child born to us, a son that we have long been waiting for. And you would not sacrifice such a cherished and precious gift as your son if you didn't have better plans for us. I pray, Jesus, that we would lean into that today, knowing full well, full well, that while what's going on in our hearts and in our lives right now might be humbling, you're gently guiding our cheek up towards you. You are not harming us. You are fulfilling us. You are raising us up to you. You are driving into our soul the very character and, and integrity and responsibility that you desire of all of your children because you love us. In Christ's name, we pray all these things. Amen.